Welcome everyone. We are live from my kitchen in Coconut Grove and we are going to finish the job that we started, which is the Florida Bar Part A. And this administration, I think I provided students with more resources than I ever have before. And I think that should be enough to carry everyone to a successful passing score on Florida Part A. If you don't have access to these interactive questions, please, everyone in my course has free access. We have the entire quiz that we did. We know that Florida Supreme Court is mandatory appellate jurisdiction over the validity of municipal bonds. Excelente. Um, we know that commercial paper, a note is a two-party instrument, a draft is a three-party instrument, respectively. We know that it's 15 days to set aside a directed verdict, the motion to set aside the verdict. Let me think about that for a second. Um, we know that it's definitely 30 days if it's not a defendant to serve the interrogatories. Super clear on that. Um, sign, written, unconditional, promise to pay, a fixed sum of money with or without interest, on demand or definitive time to order or bear with no additional undertaking. One more time, because it sounded so nice. Signed, written, unconditional, promise to pay, a fixed sum of money with or without interest, on demand or definitive time to order or bear with no additional undertakings. Oh, that sounds a lot like A. A is an Andrew. Um, yeah, it's got to be someone 15 years of age. Federal can be any reasonable age in Florida. And it's got to be 15. Um, all of these things, you know, you know who the mother is, right? You know why, but the father, if they married, if it's in writing or if they're adjudicated the father. Um, a valid will, it's got to be signed at the end, right? If the, if the signature is not after the disposition of property, then it would be an invalid will, right? You see what I'm doing right now? I'm green lighting this thing. And what we're doing, as I explained to the class, all the official Florida Board of Bar Examiner questions, which are right here um, and right here, these are the questions, these are the answers. I've been working hard on writing the explanations. We're gonna add them right to this as just a free additional resource right here at the bottom. So you could do the official Florida Board of Bar Examiner questions. You could just do what I'm doing right now. I mean, come on, if there's no PJ, then it's waived because PJ, just like venue, just like process and service of process is waived if it's not brought the first opportunity. So these questions, you see what I'm saying, this concept of green lighting. We're gonna green light all these questions and you're gonna understand um, enough to pass the exam. And we're gonna literally give you the official Florida questions, the answers and the explanations that I've written. And you could just go through them until you know them well and you have them memorized. I think this will be a great resource for people to uh, do amazing on the Florida Board of Bar Exams, or on the Florida Bar Exam. So um, anywho, I don't think anyone submitted any new album of the year. I know you guys are all sick of this by now, but not me, I think it's funny. Um, okay, and remember if you wrote essays, submit to the accountability folder. Amy and I will be grading them tonight, deep into the night. And we're proud of everyone for writing essays. The number one correlation between people who pass the exam um, is the amount of essays they've written. So if you feel like that's not you, you still have a week to practice writing essays. And I think it will be worthwhile because the more essays you write, the better it will be. Um, if you go into the materials folder, wow, what a really um, comprehensive course. A lot of ways we could go about this. Um, let's just do a little bit of a comprehensive review to start. I don't think that can hurt. Right. Um, so what is commercial paper? Signed, written, unconditional, promise to pay, a fixed sum of money with or without interest on demand or definitive time with no additional undertakings. That's going to be under Article 3 of the UCC. Um, what are the keys to commercial paper? Uh, we have to identify the instrument. Is it a note, a draft, a check or whatever? Note is a two party instrument, a maker and a payee. A draft is a three-party instrument, like a check. There's a drawer and then the intermediary, the drawer slash drawee slash payor, and then the payee. So that's a draft, three-party instrument, note, two-party instrument. Order paper is to a specific person, whereas bearer paper is, um, it can be transferred by possession. You merely just have to possess it to transfer bearer paper. Um, so these are the key concepts of commercial papers. Has it been negotiated? Negotiation is by transfer, if it's bearer paper, by uh, authentication, endorsement, if it's uh, order paper. Holder in due course is the same concept as bona fide purchaser, right? 
A holder in due course is someone who takes an instrument for value in good faith without notice. That means that they have to pay for it. If they're just given the instrument, they're not a holder in due course. What's so important about a holder in due course? A holder in due course takes free from the personal defenses and only subject to the real defenses. The personal defenses are like the contract defenses, like um, uh, a mistake of, uh, of, of, of terms or like um, fraud in the inducement or lack of consideration. Those are personal defenses. Whereas real defenses are going to be fades, fraud in the factum, alteration, uh, illegality, duress, discharging court, suretyship, statute of limitations, um, incapacity, yeah. Uh, that's kind of a difficult one. I don't wanna to get too to hold up on that, but personal offenses, real offenses, just remember personal offenses are contract offenses, real defenses are defenses on the actual instrument, like an alteration or, um, uh, uh, yeah, an alteration or a fraud in the factum, right? That's the best way to remember personal versus real. Fraud in the inducement is personal. Fraud in the factum is real. And if you can kind of just build the worlds around that, you should be fine. Uh, presentment warranties and transfer warranties are basically the same. Presentment refers to who's presenting the instrument. Transfer refers to who's transferring it. And they both basically essentially say that they're entitled to present it. They're entitled to transfer it. There's been no alterations or frauds or anything on the instrument, fake signatures or anything like that. Commercial paper, I miss you. You were a great subject. I loved you as an essay subject. I think you're gonna be super easy as a multiple choice subject. What are y'all looking for? Signed, is it signed? Written, is it written? Is there a condition on it? Do the Dolphins have to win the Super Bowl? Promise to pay, IOU. Fix some of money, that's Will Watson, with or without interest. So is it, uh, I'll pay you 30 to $60, that's not fixed. Um, on demand or definitive time, that's a key piece. It has to be either payable when you present it or a definitive time, not sometime next June. Um, to order, bearer, we know order signed over, bearer, you hold it, and then with no additional undertakings. Um, so you don't have to do anything extra. It's gonna have one of those things which will make it not negotiable under Article 3. That's what you're looking for for Article 3 questions. Secure transactions. Article 9, so you're gonna have some type of collateral, remember, um, there's tangible goods, tangible collateral, which are consumer goods, farm products, inventory, or equipment. So identifying the collateral is a key piece. Look for a security agreement. That's going to be the signed agreement. And this, the security agreement has to be a little bit more specific in terms of type of the description of the collateral than the financing statement, right? In terms of generic versus super generic. Just know that the Financing statement can be a little bit more generic, whereas the security agreement, we need to actually identify the collateral. Um, uh, we talked about PMSIs, purchase money security instrument. PMSI is like a PMM in real property where you use the money to buy the collateral, therefore have super priority. Priority will go PMSI at the top, then first to file perfected, second to file perfected, um, first to attach, and then unattached, right? So perfected will be unperfected, whereas um, uh, PMSI will prevail overall. And then priority, um, oh yeah, we just talked about that. Scarlett, you have a question? Yeah, what if you have like two PMSIs, it, is it just like whichever one came first or whichever one was, do you understand what I'm saying? Like what if there's two? P if someone borrowed money from two different people to buy the thing and they both had and they were both PMSIs. I don't know. I really just can't even consider that. But okay, um, okay, it's, sorry. It's whichever attaches first. Yeah, first to attach. Yeah. So, or file. Okay. Um, on the test, I don't see them testing between two PMSIs. Typically, and you have one PMSI the person who gave the person money to buy the thing. Usually, when they get the money, they go to buy it. If there was a conflicting PMSIs, yeah, you just have to go by general secured transactions principles: first in time, first in right. So we understand the process is attachment, perfection, priority. You attach by a security agreement, you perfect by financing statement, and then we talk about priority. Sometimes you can perfect or attach by control or possession if it's like, you know, a bank account or accounts receivable or something like that. I don't think secure transactions are very hard. 
What are you looking for in commercial paper? Holders in due course. What are you looking for in secure transactions? PMSIs. If you can understand those concepts, you're doing better than a lot of people who are like, oh my God, those subjects are so scary. Well, look at me. I created this PowerPoint in 2021 and I already predicted the three subjects that people were most scared of because they were switching. So we have the trust, um, sit tap, a settler with intent, trustee, trust race and delivery, ascertainable beneficiaries and a valid purpose. Real property and testimony trust must be in writing. Precatory language. I hope that it's insufficient to create a trust. I love this statement. This is when I used to teach it as an essay subject. The hallmark of trust creation or revocation is settler intent. So we have inter vivos trust, which is created while the settler's alive. Charitable trust, we use the Cypress doctrine, like um, uh, if the purpose no longer exists, then we'll substitute another solid charitable purpose. Pour over trust is like a gift to an inter vivos trust. So like, um, you know, it'll pour over into a trust and you can keep uh, contributing to it. Spend through provisions, right? Of all these things, the first three, they're literally gonna test you on the easiest things. Commercial paper, they're gonna test you on holder in due course. Secure transactions, they're gonna test you on PMSI. Uh, trust, they're gonna test you on spend through provisions. Who can pierce the spend through provision? Alimony, child support, someone working on the trust, Uncle Sam, right? Spend through provisions, we call it, uh, Chet Hanks provision. Spent uh, trust, remember, plups, the duties of the trustee to act personally, to act loyally, um, to separate and earmark funds, and to prudently invest. Remember the Tristy Dunks thing, which was like testamentary trust, resulting trust, inter vivos trust, support trust, discretionary trust, oral trust, no contest trust, which are not valid in Florida, charitable trust, spendthrift trust, secret trust, semi secret trust, constructive trust, mandatory trust. Shrimp on a barbecue, shrimp cocktail, um, right? Just try to know all the different types of trusts and what they mean. Secret trust, mention a beneficiary in a will. Semi-secret trust, do not ben mention a beneficiary in the will and are not enforceable. Um, criminal law, everyone should just go to my dude Hornsby's website to know the types of criminal laws. Don't sleep on that. They're always trying to throw a curveball at you. One of the curveballs could very well be an essay that's about Florida criminal law. Don't tell you I didn't tell you that. And then they're like, oh my God, they tested me about burglary and robbery and murder. How was I supposed to know that? Because I told you. Here's some types of things in Florida. Um, capital felony, life for I'm so close to this. Capital felony, life for death. Life felony, life for 25, followed by lifetime probation. First degree felony is 30 to life. Second degree felony is max 15. Third degree felony, max five. First degree misdemeanors, um, max one year. Second degree misdemeanors, max 60 days. Um, you get incarceration for misdemeanors, not imprisonment. And remember, if it's something like a uh, municipal ordinance, even if it has a little bit of uh, jail time, it's not necessarily a misdemeanor or felony if it's a violation of a municipal ordinance. So murder, homicide is not always a crime, but the act of murder is. So um, I like to think about it like that. Like um, all uh, homicides are murder, but not all, I mean, all murders are homicides, but not all homicides are murder. Homicide could also be manslaughter, right? So we have first degree, second degree, third degree. No, in Florida, first degree murder is premeditated, cold-blooded, you know, the old good, good old fashioned murder, you know, favorite type of murder or enumerated felony murder, right? Where second degree murder is depraved heart murder, you know, all other types of murder, intent to inflict great bodily harm, everything else. Third degree murder is non-enumerated felonies murder so it's like non-violent felonies maybe like dui might be a good example um florida has adopted standard ground laws there's no duty to retreat and defenses include excusable homicide justifiable homicide self-defense so manslaughter could be manslaughter by act or manslaughter by procurement the difference between voluntary and involuntary voluntary i slap you shoot that's nico's album right if someone provokes you or nico's follow-up album I walked in on the pool, but I sleep with my wife. That's his country album. And that also would result in voluntary manslaughter in a lot of cases. Involuntary manslaughter, think criminal negligence, like texting and driving or something like that. All right, criminal procedure. So um, let's talk about criminal procedure. So felony is any criminal offense punishable by death or incarceration in state correctional facility over one year. Misdemeanor is not exceeding one year. Defendant may plead not guilty, guilty, nolo contendere or they could do an Alfred pre, like uh, the number one artist in America right now. Um, 
no contenders, no contest. Alfred plea is like, I'm accepting that the weight of the evidence is pretty good, but I'm not accepting anything more than that. Um, stop and frisk is permitted in Florida, including strip searches. So your first appearance, you're notified of your right to counsel, your charges, your right to remain silent, right to communicate with others, advise of conditions and pretrial relief, release. Um, the arraignment is when, you know, you respond, guilty, not guilty, whatever. Your voir dire, see how I pronounce that, learning every administration. Examination of the jury, jurors may be challenged for cause. Um, Florida, can someone clarify it's 3610, right? The preemptory challenges? Three, six, is, yes, is misdemeanor, felony, and capital. And I said that right, 3610, misdemeanor, felony, capital? Yes. All right, see, I'm, I'm not taking, I'm taking my own bar exam on Tuesday, but I do gotta remember my job. All right, sua sponte, an act or authority taken without formal prompting from another. When I think of sua sponte, I, for some reason, I think of the MBE and the um, safe harbor rule that doesn't apply if it's like the court is punishing someone on a rule 11 violation and it's on their own sua sponte. That's where that word comes in for me. Um, sentencing guideline are based on the criminal punishment code and contempt, disobedience toward the court, direct is in court, indirect is out of court. Business entities. So corporations are subject to double taxation, right? C corps, remember? Um, double taxation and limited liability. Partnerships are flow through taxation entities. Remember partnerships are um, unlimited liability, but flow through taxation. Most businesses, LLCs and S corps um, are somewhere in the middle, right? An LLC is basically a partnership or a sole proprietorship that elects to um, have a uh, uh, limited liability, and an S-corp is basically a corporation that elects to have flow through taxation. Remember the difference between an LP and an LLP? An LP has at least one general partner, where an LLP can have all limited partners. General partners just responsible, you know, is not just, general partners responsible for everything, managing, doing all the day-to-days. That's, that's me and my business, for sure. Um, and then the uh, limited partner is like, the investor, they're limited. They just are only investing their money and they can't lose any more than they put in. The general partner could be personally liable. Um, oh, I just said that. General partners have management responsibility and personal liability. Limited partners are only liable to the extent of their investment. Um, piercing the corporate veil, so alter ego, improper conduct, proximate cause. We talked about these things. What does piercing the corporate veil means? It means going after the board directors directly. It means piercing a subsidiary to going after the parent company. Um, it's the uh, what's wrong, buddy? It's the uh, the concept of basically going after someone because they were using a shell corporation or they were using a company just to basically uh, pretend <laughs> pretend that they were someone else and do things that were pretty messed up. Um, a quorum is the majority need to validate an action in Florida. A majority will constitute a quorum. Straight voting versus cumulative voting. I don't know why people freak out about this. It's a very simple concept. Give me a second. So uh, straight voting talks about voting per chair. If you if you have 10 votes under straight voting, you get to vote, um, you know, well, let's say nine votes. Nine votes, you get to vote three, and there's three people running. Three votes for A, three votes for C, three votes for B under straight voting. Under cumulative voting, you could stack all nine of those votes and just vote it for one chair. Cumulative voting benefits a smaller investor because it allows him to have more of a, a say. That's what they say. Nothing benefits a smaller investor, but human voting um, is for that purpose, right? So you can stack your votes for one chair. Now, why do people get confused about this? Because there's also human preferred stock. What does that mean? Well, preferred stock pays dividends. Straight preferred pays dividends when they're declared by the board of directors. Human of stock, human of preferred stock will pay shareholders not only dividends on the years they're announced, but also years that were missed. So if you announce 4% year one, zero year two, 4% year three, then you actually have to pay 8% to preferred stockholders under cumulative preferred because you missed that year in arrears. So that's before common stockholders can get paid any dividends, preferred stockholders need to be paid out dividends. Under straight preferred, Preferred stockholders just need to be paid out that year's dividend payment before common stockholders can get paid. Under cumulative preferred, 
preferred stockholders need to get paid back this year's dividend payment and all payments in arrears before common stockholders can get paid out. Uh, mergers, when one company acquires the other, it's like a Pac-Man, it eats it. And then consolidation is when two companies, big bang theory into a new company. Um, remember a merger, a stock split. Um, these are things that shareholders, common stockholders will be able to vote on. Um, great, thank you for the preemptory challenges. Omar, I see that in the chat. All right, let's talk about wills. Um, will formalities, signatures by testers with intent and capacity by two subscribing witnesses. Remember, make sure it's signed at the bottom after the uh, disposition of property. Um, the witnesses need to sign in front of each other. Uh, floor and testacy laws transfer property per stirpes divided by equal representation of the original surviving issues. So we know what per stirpes means, right? Everything's split on that first level. If I have three kids, God bless, and something happens to me and I don't have a will, they'll all get one third of the pie. Now, if I have three kids and they all have grandkids, the grandkids don't get anything unless one of my kids has passed, then the grandparents will, I mean, then the grandchildren will receive that share under per stirpes. So in this situation, I have A, B, and C, A is past and A is two children. B and C, one third, one third, A is children, one six, one six, per stirpes. A codicil, Matt Beckerman says codicil. I have no idea who's right, it's a weird word, but I say codicil. I have, a, I have some weird accents. I live in Miami, Philadelphia, New Orleans. I kind of mix those three worlds together into some unintelligible language. But a codicil supplements a will, but does not replace a will. It has to comply with will formalities. Remember, if you destroy the codicil, you only destroy the codicil. If you destroy the will, you destroy the will and the codicil. If you don't have the intent to destroy something, you don't destroy it. To revoke something, you need to have the intent plus the physical act. Partial revocation is not effective in Florida, right? A holographic will, that's a handwritten will, not recognized in Florida. Um, Ademption versus abatement. Ademption is when uh, a diminution, in, I'm sorry, I just mixed them up. Ademption is when something has been deemed and it no longer exists. I, I was gonna give you the car, but that car has gone. Abatement is a diminution in, in legacies or gifts when there's less amount to give away. Wills, wills, wills. Anything else I can think about wills? Um, elective share in Florida, the wife, if you try to leave her out of the will, she can get 30%. Don't, if you want to get your wife out of the will, divorce her or your husband, divorce them because if you're just separated, they're still going to take. Um, remember the homestead piece. You can't uh, devise someone's homestead property. If you try to, then the wife will get a life estate and the kid from the other marriage will get the remainder. Um, wills, wills, wills. Uh, wills, wills, wills. There's one more thing I was going to say about wills. Um, can't remember. Names in the chat. A prenup. Yeah, do a prenup. There you go, Ariane. Yeah, prenup. Now you got it for 18 years. So here's some numbers. Everyone says, Andrew, where can I find these numbers? Here's a good place. Um, see, this there was a 45. This is where I got this from. But uh, 30 for the plaintiff, 45 for the defendant for interrogatories. This was one of our one of the questions I had to change, but we changed them the right way. So complaint 120, answer 20, pre-answer 20, reply 20, amended plea 20, answer counter cross 20, impeter 20, substitution of a deceased party 90, depositions 30, interrogatories 3045, admissions request 3045, examinations 3045, expedited trial 60, involuntary dismissal 10 months plus 60 days, summary judgments 20 days, settlement 90 days after service, 45 days before trial. Motion to set aside verdict, 15 days. Motion for new trial, 15 days. Motions for cost, 30 days. Appeals, 30 days. Case management trial, 30 days. Pre-trial conference, 20 days. Settling, setting action for trial, 20 days. Trial date, 30 days. Demand for jury trial, 10 days. Obviously, PJ is domicile minimum context. Uh, SMJ, Supreme Circuit County, venue where either defendant resides, where the cause of max are accrued or the property is located. And if you're Bre uh, Brighton and you're trying to ask me the hardest questions off the rip, if none of them are appropriate, where any of them have personal jurisdiction, where you could have personal jurisdiction over the parties. I got that question right. Now Brighton has me thinking about the five reasons that we wouldn't, we can have an interlocutory appeal. I couldn't think of the one today and I still think I can't. It was um, extraordinary writs. These are interlocutory appeals. This is federal. When can you have an appeal that uh, doesn't have to be final judgment? Interlocutory writs. It was 
injunction. It was certification of a class. It was collateral order doctrine. And it was like, if there was partial judgments that have kind of been whatever, that was what I didn't really understand. But you see, all this stuff works. If you guys come to class and you pay attention, you play my little games, it all adds up to passing scores. All right, torts. Torts is my, <laughs> I'm saying my favorite subject on the ladder. I don't like any of this stuff. It's just my job. I like football and boxing. So torts is like a, an easy subject to write about, in my opinion. You throw the kitchen sink at them. If you look at the model answers, they always write about IID and NID. Literally, at the end of it, they're like, you know what? Let's just throw this in. I want you to get in the habit of throwing some things in. We now know that Florida is a modified comparative negligence state, which means if you're over 50% at fault, you cannot recover. We know that Florida has abolished joint and several liability. We know that in Florida, punitive damages are limited to three times compensatory or 500,000, the greater of the two, unless it's for like, you know, really bad stuff, like against the elderly or the, you know, disabled or some things like that. Um, so what about torts? Negligence will be duty, breach, causation, damages, considered negligence per se. What is negligence per se? It's if there's a statute that defines what negligence would be. Like, uh, I mean, a pretty good one is a speed limit, right? Like you went over to speed limit, that's pretty negligent. Or like, um, it could even be criminal. It could be like a criminal code that defines some standard that if you do it wrong, that's negligence. Remember it has to be the designed injury, the protected class and all that mumbo jumbo. So like if you park a car outside of a fire hydrant and another car hits you, that's not negligent per se because the, the purpose of the statute was for the firefighters to access the fire hydrant, not for Sammy the swerver not to swerve into you. So like, you know, understand negligence per se, definitely write about it. Duty breach causation damages. Remember there has to be actual and proximate um, foreseeable and but for, right? Foreseeable is uh, actual is the but for and then foreseeable is the proximate cause like Cardoza or um, Andrews, which is the zone of danger, the foreseeable plaintiff. So make sure you have that. Um, Let's see, intentional torts, assault, battery, false imprisonment, trespass to land, trespass to chattels, conversion, fraud, defamation, IID. I used to say a lot more, assault, battery, um, intentional infliction of emotional stress, intentional interference with the business relationship, malicious prosecution, uh, the privacy torts, I would say, which would be in Florida. Um, we do not recognize false light, but we do recognize like um, in, intrusion upon seclusion, uh, disclosure and um, appropriation or misappropriation. Uh, they test about defamation all the time. And they love this piece that newspapers have 10 days to retract, right? They love testing that for whatever reason. Uh, intentional torch, remember you have to improve the intent, just go down that path. Uh, IID and NID, Florida usually requires a physical impact. The difference is intent. Shopkeeper's privilege is like a right to retain for investigation. So, you know, when uh, Sammy the thief is, is taking her new pair of shoes out and the big bodyguard says, oh, wait up, let me search you. That's okay, but once he figures out she has or she hasn't taken it, he can't continue it. Or if someone's going crazy in the bar and trying to kill everyone and you're like, yo, let me hold on to this person. That would be uh, an example of um, shopkeeper's privilege or some type of privilege. Good Samaritan law will protect rescuers from liability. Um, they'll probably tell you about Florida's Good Samaritan laws in the question. Medical malpractice, they must follow strict procedure, including expert opinion and nine-day notice. So basically, if you're going to sue for medical malpractice, you need to get a third-party expert to say that you have a valid claim. You have to give them 90 days notice. And then there's a whole process of whether they can choose arbitration or mediation and the like. Um, Race ipsa loquitur, the thing speaks for itself. A scalpel is left inside of an organ or the plant falls off of the person's head. I mean, <laughs> the plant falls off of the balcony and falls on the person's head. It's been a long, long administration. Um, Responding superior, my student, my pride and joy, Joel, he got 156 last time. The 156 that's gonna be beat this time by one of y'all. But when he got to 156, I talked to him after the essay. We're going boom, boom, boom. You hit everything, you hit everything. You hit Responding superior. Oh my God, I can't believe I missed it. So you know what? You can get a 156 and miss a big thing, but that just shows that we can get higher. Responding superiors by vicarious liability for employers, consider the frolic and the detour. The frolic is you're going off to do drugs with your 
girlfriend in the woods and the um that's the frolic the detours you're just grabbing a cup of coffee from starbucks so uh de defamation papers have 10 days to retract libel written slander spoken truth is offense remember slander per se club crimes of moral turpitude loathsome disease unchastity business those are going to be important Let's see if it's slander per se know that there's a different standard if it's a public figure or private figure and argue both ways. If I can get one point across to everyone about writing essays, do the I, the IRAOC method, issue rule analysis, opposing argument conclusion. Remember the opposing argument. They will argue that Andrew the tutor is nobody and therefore the standard is negligence. I would argue that Andrew is actually has 450 subscribers on YouTube. He's famous, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, there's an argument, and therefore he would be judged by a uh, a um, a heightened standard of malice. They have to actually prove that it was malicious, right? So make sure you can write about defamation. Why? Because defamation also implicates constitutional things, and they love to cross over. So make sure you understand First Amendment, defamation, and the like. And then products liability, they love to test. Strict liability, implied warranties of merchantability, fitness for a particular purpose. Products liability is all about someone placing a defective product in the stream of commerce. And it was defective when it left their hands, right? If you are a component manufacturer and you create a component and that component was manufactured fine and the idiot you gave it to puts the wrong thing in the wrong place and it was not foreseeable he was going to do that, you wouldn't be liable. That's one example of when, you know, products liability doesn't uh, attach but the next person who got the the defective uh thing and sold it that person would be liable downstream right after the defect everyone's liable but before the defect they're not liable it's if you place a defective product in the chain of commerce now there's going to be a manufacturing defect and a design defect a manufacturing defect is if someone uh put one on the line differently like you know you're in a chop shop and well not chop shop but a gerald ford conveyor belt and you know one of them is manufactured wrongly that's a manufacturing defect a design defect is the whole design of the automobile or whatever was uh improper and you, for design defect you're going to consider the balancing test right to the utility and the and the um potential for harm which outweighed which and was there an opportunity to design it differently and what would have been the effect of that. So consider the balancing test for design defect, for manufacturing defect, if it was came off the line differently, um, a warranty defect, if the express warranty was a failure to warn, a poor warning label, implied warranty, merchantability, fitness for a particular purpose. These are all different ways that we could bring a products liability case. And then quote me on this when I'm famous. Whenever there is a products liability case, there is a contemporaneous argument for negligence. Whenever there is a strict liability, products liability case, there is a contemporaneous argument for negligence. Remember that you are an attorney. One of my uh, students last administration passed and she was in, yeah, she had anxiety, right? That's a nice way to say it. She's nice and had anxiety. And a lot of y'all have anxiety. I have anxiety. What do you mean? Anxiety is normal. But she had anxiety and she wasn't really good at multiple choice. She would have, I would wish she had the resources that I had now for multiple choice, but she didn't. She had what I had working with last administration. But I did have one thing in her in her arsenal. She practiced personal injury law in Connecticut. And I was like, look, do you get that torts essay? You better blow this one out of the water. And she really did. She got like an 86 on that torts essay. And that carried her to a passing score. I mean, she didn't even tell me what she got. She was like, Yeah, my torts essay carried me. I got an 86. Like, and then she's supposed to refer me all this business. I haven't heard from her since, but so the game goes. But um, my point in that is like, you know, you can crush one of these essays. Uh, Torts is an opportunity for you to write an amazing essay. And remember, if you're like her, you're an attorney. What's the theory? You're bringing the kitchen sink. I have a client. I want this client to get paid. So I get paid. I know a lot about the law. I'm going to bring every claim possible. And the judges are going to go, no, no, no. Maybe, no, 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 but you don't get hurt for saying, this is the argument for strict liability, la di da da put a defective product in the stream of commerce and all these things. On the alternative, this is the argument for negligence. It was negligent to design it this way. It was negligent for this stupid idiot did this, breached his duty, duty causation, duty breach causation, right? 
you're going to just give them other causes of action. If you get a torts essay, it's all about causes of action. Bring them all. They're all coming along. It is okay to say this argument will likely fail. In fact, you better write that three times an essay, honestly. I'm not trying to like give you any bright line rules, but I'm just saying it's okay and it's encouraged to write essays that will fail because you have to write the opposing argument, even if it's an, a failing argument. This is an outdated statement, right? Florida is a modified comparative negligence state. All right, evidence, let's talk about some evidence. Hearsay, an out-of-court statement proffered into evidence in order to prove the truth of the matter asserted. See, dog barking, is that hearsay? No, because it's a human statement, right? It can't be a dog barking, it can't be a machine. It's gotta be a human statement. Um, things that are not hearsay, prior and consistent statement, admission by defendant or party opponent. Um, in Florida, and there's no uh, exemptions, there's only exceptions, right? So in the federal law, law this might be a non, and this might be an exemption. In Florida, it's just considered non-hearsay, right? Um, exceptions will be present sense impression, excited utterance, then existing mental, emotional, physical condition, medical diagnosis or business record, and then hearsay, but exception if the parent is unavailable, former testimony under oath, dying declaration, statement against interest, statement against person who made the parent unavailable. Mandatory notice of decisions of the Florida legislature and Congress, Florida rules of court, rules of the US Supreme Court and Court of Appeal. Presumptions are rebuttable, and less conclusive under law. Some pieces about evidence, they love testing about Florida um, does not allow opinion testimony. So you can say you have heard something because that's reputation, but you can't say it's your opinion that. Um, Florida doesn't recognize the learned treatise exception, but it can be used to impeach on cross as we see from a common question. Um, other things about evidence, Florida evidence. I really think that Florida evidence is a tough subject because it really directly um, conflicts with federal evidence in a lot of ways. So uh, let's see. Um, yeah, I agree, Arian. I think admission is an exception in Florida. I wasn't sure if it was an exception or not hearsay, but I'm pretty sure it's an exception. I know it's not an exemption. In, in federal law, a party opponent admission is an exemption. Can someone clarify for 100% certainty? Yeah, it's an exception. All right, thank you. I misspoke about that. I, as I said, it rolled off the tongue wrongly. It's an uh, exception um, in Florida, and it's an exemption in federal law. But either way, it's not. It's going to come in, right? But that's important to know. Things are going to come in. Things are not going to come in. Florida has moved to the Daubert standard for uh, expert witnesses. Um, let's see. And then handed us, giving us this super sweet chart uh, with a Florida versus federal uh, exemption. So we can see, yeah, um, non hearsay, uh, that's federal. We want to go into Florida. So Florida non hearsay is prior statements, prior inconsistent statement, prior consistent statement, prior statement of identification. Exception. So good. We exceptionally have learned this. Florida is an admission. Um, mission by a party opponent, adoptive admission, authorized admission, vicarious submission, a co-conspirator statement. And then hearsay exceptions, we just kind of went over, but this is much more complete. Former testimony, dying deck, statements against interest, statements of personal family history, statements by deceased or ill, statements offered against a party that wrongfully caused the unavailability. That you all need unavailability is required. Unavailability is immaterial for Spontaneous statement, excited utterance, then existing mental, emotional, physical condition, statement for purposes of medical diagnosis or treatment, recorded recollection, regularly conducted business activity, absence of records of entry, um, public records and reports, records of vital statistics, absence of public record of entry, records of religious organizations, marriage, baptism, similar certifications, family records, documents affecting interest in property, uh, ancient documents, market reports, commercial publications. A lot of those things. Excellent. Appreciate that, Hannah. So yeah, hearsay could be tough. Um, real property, uh, deed formalities. In order for a deed to be valid under Florida law, it must be attested by two witnesses and contain an accurate description of the land and be properly delivered. In order for a deed to be properly delivered, physical delivery is not required, right? It just has to be leave your control. Um, Florida is a pure notice statute, 
which means subsequent bona fide purchasers without notice prevail, the order of the recording after is irrelevant. So remember general warranty deed, upstream title clearance, special warranty deed is just present title clearance and a quick claim deed really provides nothing. Remember with a general warranty deed, there's the six covenants, there's the three present covenants of um, the right to convey, the right against encumbrances and uh, the right of sizing. Right of sizing. Sorry. And then um, future warranties are uh, quiet enjoyment, further assurances, and general warranties, right? Um, so joint tenants with the right of survivorship. So if it's a JTROS, just know that Andrew and Brian are JTROSs. If Andrew passes, the property automatically goes to Brian. Um, TIC, Andrew and Brian are tenants. If Andrew passes, then Andrew's heirs will take his portion. Uh, tenancy by entirety is created plus marriage in Florida. There's no need for a straw man. Um, equitable servitude differ from covenants in that they're enforceable by injunction, while real covenant is remedied by money damages. No horizontal or vertical privity is required for a servitude to run with the land, but you do need um, that for a covenant. Servitudes are ownership interests in land, while real covenants are promises. So remember, for a real covenant to run with the land, there has to be notice, intent, touch and concern the land, and there also has to be privity um, and be in writing. While an equitable servitude, there's no need for that privity requirement for it to run with the land. When you think of a covenant, think of the blue door in my uh, townhouse association. We all have to have blue doors. Uh, or that could be an equitable servitude. I mean, it could be either one of them, but they're both promises on land. So waste, they love uh, testing about waste. Permissive, um, letting things rot, actual causing waste, actual voluntary, there's another word they use. Um, and then ameliorative, which is beneficial, but still waste. Like if you do something that improves the property, but still causes waste, that's gonna be ameliorative waste. Adverse possession, a hostile ocean, hostile, open, continuous, exclusive, actual, notorious for seven years in Florida, right? Um, Easements, express, implied, easement by necessity, easement by prescription, 20 years in Florida, easement of pertinent, it takes two, easement in gross and negative easement. And Florida is a lien theory state. What does that mean? It means that um, an encumbrance on the property will not sever a JTROS. And if one person dies, then the mortgagee will not be able to collect from that person. Very much understand how to write about mortgages, right? What is a mortgage? A mortgage is a. Um, a mortgage is a loan that is collateralized by property. And the mortgagor uh, has to pay back the mortgagee, usually in installments over time plus interest. If he fails to pay back, the mortgagee can institute a foreclosure action and force the, the sale of the home. Um, the forced sale of the home will pay off the senior mortgagee and any junior mortgagees or any um, deficiencies for the senior mortgagee will be sought out in a deficiency action. In Florida, there's an equitable right of redemption before the sale of the home and a statutory right of redemption after the sale of the home. Know about in Florida, the theory of uh, merger, right? The contract will merge with the deed and know about the theory of um, equitable conversion where between the contract date and the closing date during that period of escrow, there will be a risk of loss transfer to the buyer. Contracts, UCC Article 2 for goods, common law for services, offer acceptance, consideration, no valid defenses in the necessary terms, statute of frauds, my legs, marriage, contracts that can be not going to be within one year, land, executorships, goods over $500 and sureties. Remember, we can go further. What are the ways we can overcome a statute of frauds defense? We can do swaps, specially manufactured goods, written confirmatory memo, admission in court, promissory estoppel, or partial performance. Those are ways you can overcome the statute of frauds. Um, some defenses, infancy, incapacity, insanity, incompetency, impossibility, influence, intoxication, unconscionability, duress, fraud. A lot of eyes. I knew there's more eyes when I taught this. I just can never remember them all. Unilateral versus mutual mistake, voidable versus void, right? Unilateral mistake is voidable by um, the non-mistaken party if the mistaken party, I'm sorry, a, a unilateral mistake is potentially voidable 
by the mistaken party if the non-mistaken party knew of the mistaken party's mistake and essentially took advantage of them, right? But if the unilateral mistake was just a dumb mistake, then the mistaken party will bear the burden of their mistake. Um, mirror image rule for common law versus the um, bow the foreign provision under the UCC. Mirror image rule, the offer must match the um, acceptance exactly. Under the UCC, the bow the foreign provision will say that an additional term, if it's immaterial, will be included unless expressly, you know, the offer says no and within 10 days, reasonable time. Um, and if there's conflicting clauses, then if there's a conflicting additional term, it'll be knocked out and UCC gap fillers will apply. Question could can arise as what is a material additional term? I would look for something like an exculpation clause or something that limits liability in, a, in an extent, right? But you can argue both ways most of the time whether the additional clause will be included or will not be included. Just make sure to know body of law, UCC versus common law, contract formation, offer acceptance consideration, no valid defenses, merchants. It's important to note that they are merchants because there's special rules that apply to merchants. For instance, the battle of the forms provision, no additional considerations necessary for modification, um, a whole bunch of rules that could potentially apply to merchants. Uh, so um, we talk about the mailbox rule, um, right? Offer is effective upon receipt, mostly everything else upon dispatch, because you, you know the, uh, the contract is effective the moment the formation has occurred. So the offer is out there. Once the acceptance has occurred, we have acceptance. Um, okay. Anticipatory repudiation. One party uh, unequivocally expresses an intent not to honor the contract, then that would be an anticipatory repudiation, right? And merchants can request, uh, can need to send a request for further assurances. And if that's not complied within 30 days, then they could sue for a breach. Now, if it's just clearly obvious that the request for further assurances is futile, they can sue immediately. Legal remedies, make sure you do your damages. Compensatory, expectation, reliance, punitive, rare in contract, but potentially available, nominal, incidental, liquidated, restitution, quasi-contract. Equitable relief, specific performance, injunctive relief, rescission, reformation, replevin, promissory estoppel. Excellent. Um, I can't really zoom in. Computers on his last leg, anyway. Okay. Um, all right. So, family law. In Florida, the court will follow the best interest of the child standard in determining the custody arrangements of the minor child. The court prefers to grant both parents shared parental responsibility, responsibility shared for the child, as well as decisions in the child's upbringing, et cetera, and will generally grant primary residential custody to one parent and liberal reasonable visitation to a non-residential parent. Um, Florida, you have a constitutional right to the upbringing of your children. We wanna give the children a chance. A spouse who is a resident of Florida for at least six months prior to petitioning for divorce may petition the court for divorce on the following grounds. The marriage is irretrievably broken. The other spouse has been adjudicated mentally incompetent as remained so for the past three years prior to petition. Remember, Florida is a no-fault divorce state. Upon divorce petition for divorce, the court is required under Florida law to distribute the marital assets under the equitable distribution doctrine. In order to do so, the court must first distinguish between marital and non-marital assets. The court must divide the property equitably and will generally attempt to achieve a 50-50 split, half to each spouse. However, the court may alter the distribution percentage of equity so requires. So we know with the alimony, there's temporary, lump sum, pendente, rehabilitative, and durational. We have eliminated permanent uh, alimony in Florida. Um, we also, in Florida, don't need a modification to prove that it is a unforeseen change in circumstance. It just needs to be a substantial material change in circumstance. I think Florida law could be pretty easy. Know about JV piece, jurisdiction, venue, parenting plan, equitable distribution, alimony, child support, um, Esquire fees and uh, divorce distribution, things like that. Family law, you can cruise through. 
ethics. Everyone should memorize this sentence the day before the morning of the exam. The ethical duties of the Florida lawyers are outlined in the decisions of the Florida Supreme Court, the Florida rules of professional responsibility, the ideals and goals of professionalism, the oath and mission to the Florida bar, the creed of the Florida bar and other documents. All Florida lawyers must comply with the professional responsibility obligations and are subject to discipline for non-compliance. Beautiful statement. So referral fees, any agreement to share money with another law firm must be in writing, signed by the client, stating the terms of the arrangement, and in most cases, making the parties jointly or severally liable or defining the arrangement by the amount of work done. The business transaction rule, a lawyer cannot engage in a business transaction with a client unless the lawyer makes full and fair disclosure of the terms of the deal confirmed in writing, the deal is fair and reasonable to the client, and the client is informed of the desirability of seeking independent counsel with respect to the transaction. Make sure you understand the duty of confidentiality, conflict of interest, duty of competency, duty not to commingle funds, improper purpose. These are all things that we understand, but we want to make sure we get points for it. Honest and effective communication is important. Adherence to a fundamental sense of honor, integrity, and fair play. A commitment to equal justice under the law and to the public good. The just, speedy, and inexpensive determination of every controversy is necessary to preserve our system of justice. When lawyers display reverence to the law, the judicial system, and the legal profession by acting with respect, decorum, and courtesy, they earn the trust of the public and help to preserve faith in the operation of a fair judicial system. Respecting the time and commitments of others is essential to the efficient and fair resolution of legal matters. An enduring value of lawyer's service is grounded in the lawyer's willingness to exercise independent judgment and practice and while giving the client advice and counsel. All right, let's talk about some common law things. So the homestead exemption. Homestead is defined as up to a half an acre of land in a municipality and 160 contiguous acres of land outside the municipality. The Florida Constitution expressly gives rights to spouses and minor children under the homestead provisions, and the provisions are designed for the protection of spouses and minor children. A person may only have one homestead and must establish the homestead by showing the home as the primary residence, voter registration, etc. A homestead property, even if owned solely in one spouse's name, may not be conveyed or devised from the other spouse or the spouse's minor children. Any conveyance of an interest in the homestead property must be consented to by both spouses. If not, the conveyance is void. So the Sunshine Laws. Florida's government of Sunshine Law provides a right of access to governmental proceedings at both the state and local levels. It applies to any gathering of two or more members of the same board to discuss some matter which will foreseeably come before the board for that action. So Bill Act formalities, enacting clause, single subject rule, clear title, has to be for the health welfare and morals of the people of Florida. Um, it can't be vague or overbroad. General law applies to state populace at large. Special law applies to a particular class or, or location and it requires a vote, a referendum. General laws of local application are population specific. Local laws are like county taxes, school districts, municipality, special districts. Ad valorem are property taxes, right? Um, and the state cannot collect property taxes. That's a county thing, right? Like you pay property taxes to like the county. Um, and then federal con law, strict scrutiny, government infringement on a, uh, one thing I just want to mention this, the Kluger doctrine, right? Make sure everyone remembers the Kluger doctrine in Florida. You can uh, override your access to court if there is a fundamental right. The, the government can abridge the access to courts for extraordinary purposes under the Kluger Doctrine. I've seen that tested a few times. The Kluger Doctrine is just, yes, access to courts is subject to strict scrutiny, but under the Kluger Doctrine, you can, the uh, government can abridge that right for a necessary, compelling government uh, public need. So that's the Kluger Doctrine. But most importantly for F F Florida, Con law is going to be homestead exemption, sunshine law, general laws, special laws, general laws of local application, enacting a law in Florida, things like that. Be on the lookout for entanglement, right? We don't want there to be entanglement or a separation of powers issue. All right, let's see what we got here. Uh, strict scrutiny, government infringement on a fundamental right must be narrowly tailored to achieve a compelling government interest. This will apply to suspect classes 
This will apply to all your fundamental rights, the camper rights, contraception, marriage, procreation, ed right to educate your children, uh, right to raise your children, right to vote, right to travel, um, access to courts, First Amendment, freedom of speech, due process rights. All these fundamental rights are going to be subject to strict scrutiny. Um, suspect classes in Florida are going to be race, alienage, national origin, and disability. Intermediate scrutiny must promote an important government interest and be substantially related to achieving that interest, sex-based classifications. Rational basis, uh, rationally related to legitimate government interest, no fundamental or suspect class involved. Um, vagueness and overbreath. I think these are pillars of Florida con or federal common law essays, Florida common law essays. Always look out for vagueness and overbreath. A statute is too vague if people of common intelligence would have to guess at the statute's meaning. And it's overbroad if it's not sufficiently restricted to a specific subject or purpose. Due process is the legal requirement that requires the state to respect all the legal rights owed to a person. So procedural due process is notice and hearing. Substantive due process is, you know, your actual rights. Um, what's the difference between substantive due process and equal protection? Well, federal right, substantive due process, equal protection is 14th Amendment right applied to the states. And then also equal protection is when a specific group is being discriminated against, whereas due process is substantive due process when everyone's being discriminated against. Um, remember, you always want to start your essay off with state action and standing. Standing will be injury causation, redressability, rightness, and not mootness. Equal protection, um, 14th Amendment, individual rights, so that, you know, we talk about that. Uh, um, yeah, equal protection issue could totally, totally come up. If they're discriminating against a certain group of people, you want to see what group of people are they, and then are they going to be subject to rational basis, intermediate scrutiny, or uh, strict scrutiny, depending on what type of deprivation of rights it may be. Privilege and immunities clause. So under Article 4, it prevents a state from discriminating against non-residences, uh, non-residents. Um, so that could be like charging more for commercial fishing license in Florida for people from Georgia. If it's a residential license, it wouldn't be privileged and immunities. They're allowed to do that. That's why you're allowed to go to Disney World and pay less, but not if it was commercial. The dormant commerce clause. So obviously the commerce clause, commerce clause, the, the federal government can regulate the channels, instrumentalities, and economic activities that in aggregate have a substantial effect on interstate commerce. And the negative implications of the dormant clause, commerce clause, the negative com commerce clause is that states can't enact legislation that is discriminatory on its face against interstate commerce or that unduly burdens interstate commerce and it'll be subject to you know, a balancing test as well. Other things that could come up, maybe the commandeering clause, the federal government can't commandeer the states. Um, look for contracts clause, impairment of contracts clause. They can't impair existing public or private contracts. Look for ex post facto laws. They can't make laws that retroactively punish. Um, look for uh, bills of attainder. They can't put people uh, in, in jail punishment without trial. Those are some other things I could potentially see coming up with federal con law. Um, any questions? So let me just see where the slide ended up. Oh, the last slide I was supposed to be. Oh, there we go. Um, I can accept failure. Everyone fails at something, but I can't accept not trying. I really think that's the most poignant quote. I, I got to give credit to whoever put that up there because look at Jordan looking all sweaty and championship like that's a great way to think about things you can accept failure but you can't accept not trying at this point we're all locked in we're all taking the test it's coming up whether we like it or not you can't look backwards all you can do is keep marching confidently forward and take it on a day-by-day -day approach give yourself an assignment for the day and do that assignment well and i'll tell you i've been doing this for years it's okay if you don't pass this test, it's not the end of the world at all. People come right back around and have amazingly successful careers. I could name a thousand people who didn't pass on the first time. But if you really, really want to make sure that this time is the time you pass, all you can do is take care of business as much as possible in the upcoming days. It's been really, really amazing to work with everyone. I know we still have two more sessions together, and I'm going to give my all to make sure that you have everything you need. Um, like I said, the Official FBBE questions, answers, and explanations 
are on the drive, but they'll be added to the digital format as soon as possible. And tonight, Amy and I will be grading your essays to give you as much feedback as possible. I hope tonight was super valuable. Thank you.